to our next talk. Uh, Scott will present edit distance heuristics for rewrite search. So. Okay. Yeah. So, so this was intended to be a, a, a very quick uh, demo, but maybe I'll, I'll uh, spend a little bit of the beginning giving a little bit of the background for the thing I, I want to demo right at the end. Uh, so uh, I'm very much a, a mathematician, and uh, the thing that I want to show you here is a little exploration from an alien into, the, into this field. Uh, the thing that I'm going to show you is a little piece of, um, of automation that I've written. Uh, and in particular, that automation being deployed uh, in a category theory library written in Lean. Now, I know that a mathematician coming along, to learning how to use an interactive theorem prover, and starting to write a category theory library is almost self parody at this point. Uh, but I, I want to very much emphasize that the category theory for li library per se, I, I don't care about very much. Uh, it's really just intended as something for me to play with in order to. Uh, to the, the real experiment, uh, which I, I, I want to do, which is to be able to report back to my colleagues in a, in a math department uh, about whether it's time that they should start paying attention to interactive theorem proofs. Now, the answer after about a year and a half of playing with interactive theorem proofs is a resounding no. Um, <laughs> but I've been, uh, the, the, your guys' claws are, are into me now, and I, 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 I'm interested anyway. Uh, but the, everything that I've been doing uh, has been uh, to explore using interactive theorem proofs within the constraints that I only want to write code that I can show to other mathematicians and that they will not be horrified by. Uh, so it's been slow progress. Uh, things that have been so far here have been uh, in Lean, and uh, while I've been very encouraged uh, by my experience with, with Lean so far, and when I've shown other mathematicians, sometimes very occasionally they respond positively, uh, but Again, uh, I don't think I have any particular attack on the lean, and if the, newest, if the newer thing comes along, I will very quickly jump to that. I just want the first thing that I can show to other mathematicians and have them pay attention to. Okay, um, so what I'm going to show you is, uh, to begin with, is just a, a little piece um, from this category theory library that, uh, that I've been writing. And uh, in particular, this, this file here is the, the proof of the innate lemma and, uh, and some, uh, some associated bits and pieces. So I'm not going to, um, this isn't a, a lean tutorial, so don't worry too much if, if uh, you're unfamiliar with lean and don't know about the syntax, it doesn't matter. Uh, these four lines here are the definition of the innate embedding itself, so we're setting up a functor from the category C into uh, functors from C opposite into the, the category of types. And then uh, we spend a couple of lines saying what the innate lemma actually does. So for example, here on object, it takes an object x of c, and here we're constructing some functor, that is a functor in c opposite of the types. So we say what it does on objects, on an object y, it's just the home space from y to x. And we say what it does on morphisms, which is just composition of, of morphisms. So, uh, oh, and then similarly in the last line, we say what innate does on the level of sending morphisms here into natural transformations. So something to, uh, to notice in those couple of lines is that when we construct, uh, we can, in the course of this we construct two functors, one little functor in here and then the whole big functor itself, and we construct one natural transformation here, and we never actually mention our proof obligations, the fact that functor reality preserves identities in composition, or that naturality actually satisfies the naturality square. And that's of course being taken care of by a, a little piece of automation. Uh, and that's generally sort of the, the, the bar I've been setting myself that I would just refuse to write code uh, where I would have to dis discharge proof obligations that a mathematician never would. Uh, of course, a mathematician would only write down this when describing the innate lemma and say, naturality is obvious, functorality is obvious. Okay, so that's nice. Maybe just let me, well, okay, let me yeah, just quickly go through the rest of this file. Uh, very, very quickly. Uh, at the end of this file, I think a mere 40 lines later, uh, We've, we've proved the Yoneda lemma. So here we've got the uh, Yoneda evaluation, which is just saying that if you have a, uh, where are these things? Uh, let's just go up and look at the type signature quickly. So Yoneda evaluation is something that's taking a, uh, a pre-sheaf on, on C, so a functor from C opposite to types, and, uh, and an object of C, and we're just mapping uh, we're just defining the functor that takes that into, into some category of types, which all that it does is just takes that functor and applies it to that object. 
And then can, in a few lines down, we have the innate pairing, which instead uh, takes our functor and our object, uses the innate embedding to turn this also into a functor, and then calculates the, the natural transformations between them. And when it's time to prove the actual innate lemma, that we have a natural isomorphism between these two things, we merely write down the actual uh, uh, the actual uh, uh, the actual natural transformations, uh, admitting that they're natural entirely, and admitting that they're actually inverses of each other. Okay, so uh, that's a that's a proof that you could you could show to a, a mathematician and they wouldn't complain that they were being asked to jump through any hoops. Okay, just for I mean. I, I know this is this is maybe rude, but uh, just sort of by way of comparison, uh, here's, like, here's the Unimath file that does the same thing in in 400 odd lines. Um, here's the Lean2 homotopy type theory library, which does the same thing in in a mere 160 lines. Uh, here's the hot book, which does it in in 350 odd lines. Oh, uh, no, no, no. One's in Cock and one's in Lean, I think. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, yep. <laughs> it's true. It's true. I'm, thank you. Um, here is the the only one I could find in Isabel. Uh, we should check the book because it was written by my mathematicians to see whether what they did. Yep, yep. Uh, th this one I could find in Isabel. Um, somewhat terrifyingly, goes on for about fifteen pages. Um, Mathlib uh, has indeed many, many pages and subpages and so on. Okay. Uh, so there's, oh, and this is the one that I was just showing you, the, the 40 lines with no proof obligations ever actually dealt with. Okay, so uh, that's the sort of thing that I've been trying to do, and I just want to briefly now say uh, how one does this and then show you uh, one pretty picture. So something to notice in all of this is that we do have some, a few intermediate lemmas along the way to proving the Aneda lemma these boringly named uh, your nader aux one and your nader aux two, and those are things that I did actually have to realize, oh, that's a, that's a lemma I need, to, I need to prove in order to have my automation actually get there. So that's a, that's a little bit of a pity that that can't be done. Wait, how many kernels do you have? Ah, uh, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, double, double, my, double my line count. Sometimes some of these lines are a little long. Okay, yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very full, fair point. But the, the, col the columns, uh, I have a big monitor on my desk at home. Uh, they all fit there. Um, but the, the point about line numbers is obviously silly. Uh, there are no proof. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, my, my point about the line numbers is obviously silly, is the, is the thing. Uh, that's, a, that's a silly thing to compare. But you can, I, I'll promise you that no proof obligations are being dealt with by a human in the columns that are hiding off to the right. <laughs> so I can confirm, check. The hot book does, in fact, do the thing that mathematicians do. It doesn't, the proof obligations are not even mentioned. Right? Ah, it, it oh. Does oh. Exactly the book itself. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So these these little these little lemmas that I did need along the way, which are a little bit a little bit sad, um, are all either proved well by Ruffle, which is pretty safe, uh, and those lemmas are just giving hints to the Lean simplifier, saying you're actually allowed to unfold the definition of your nader in certain cases uh, when it's actually sort of fully applied to objects and morphisms and so on. You're allowed to know what it says. And then there are a few other, a few other um, lemmas or results that are proved uh, by obviously. So obviously is the, is the unfortunately named tactic uh, that I've been writing. So for example, yeah. F11. No? Uh, I'm actually... Yeah, isn't it full screen already? I don't quite understand what the. I don't, I don't see another. I don't see an option. Ah, oh, maybe. <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm just about to explain that. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, for example, here on this line where we prove that the uh, unitive functor uh, is faithful, we do this just with the tactic uh, by obviously, which is just a name for my my automation. Now, something I've arranged all of my automation does is uh, it uh, always reports back a tactic script written in, in, in basic lean that achieves the same thing that it did. 
So we can always, if we like, uh, get rid of the use of obviously and, and go back to just calling. Uh, all of the green underlines are just the trace messages, which usually are turned off, but I turned on for this demo, so that obviously all those reports exactly what it did. So for example, if I take this and copy and paste it, uh, and I remove by obviously, and begin a little tactic block, uh, and, oops, and paste it, um, we, well, again, <laughs> again, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, it's one line, we can put some, some of these new line characters. I mean, humans obviously aren't meant to read this, so like, who cares if it scrolls off the screen? And you can see the sorts of things that obviously is doing. Um, it, it's it obviously, uh, well, I'll show you in a second uh, something about what obviously does, but it, it does a variety of steps. Uh, it's extremely conservative. It, it never backtracks, it never searches, it always just knows what to do next and otherwise fails. Uh, and it, I try very strongly to have it not just be a finishing tactic in the sense that if it fails, it will give you goals that are still recognizable to humans. Okay. Okay, so I'll show you a slightly bigger example of what obviously does. Um, as an indication of just how experimental and gross this all is, in order to show you this other example, I'm going to have to switch to another commit of the same repository, because in the space of the last couple of days, I managed to break all of this functionality in the, in, in the master, and uh, we have to go back to a slightly different one. Okay, so where are we? Okay, uh, here we are... Uh, doing some other very basic category theory. We're just saying that if you have an equivalence of categories, that's our E, uh, then the underlying functor from left to right uh, is a full functor, okay? And again, we just write what a, what a human mathematician would really write. That is, we give a formula for the pre-image of some morphism in terms of the bits and pieces of the, the equivalence and the, and the morphism you've got, and it's it's, that's really the end uh, of my long line. Uh, but it, okay, that's just the formula there. And then the proof just uh, expresses the one idea that a, a human mathematician would say, which is that, ah, you should use the fact that you've already proved that both pieces of an equivalence are, are, uh, are faithful and think about using the faithfulness of the inverse of the, of the equivalence. So we just apply injectivity of the equivalence and then say, ah, it's obvious after that. Okay, so it works, obviously spits out a lot of output, and let me at this point just show you that obviously really consists of two things. Obviously consists of, of tidy, which is the actual tactic that's very conservative and, and only does things when it's sure it's right and preserves human readable goals, but it very much fails on this one. It gives us some gigantic thing that we're meant to prove this is equal to that. Uh, I can't even, it's, uh, I mean. It, it progresses, yeah, so, so tidy did something, but if you, if we ask what tidy did, we'll find that in this case, uh, how do we ask it? Trace result equals true. Uh, we, it, it did very little actually. It just did some simplification, a definitional simplification. It couldn't find much to do in this case. Obviously is just the union, try tidy, with additional access to this tactic rewrite search. And that's the thing that I promised in the title that I would show you, uh, without which this automation in the category theory library would not solve the class of problems it does, um, but uh, seems to be reasonably effective if, if somewhat slow. So what I'm going to do now is um, just quickly go back to running obviously by itself. Uh, as you can see, it is actually slow. This rewrite search stuff was written basically in the last couple of weeks, and there's been no attempt to make it run fast. Uh, it's very slow. <laughs> Obviously, is running at the moment. That yellow bar on the side is is the is the I'm working. Uh, we seem to be running extra slow. Oh, there we go. Okay, so the green squiggles appeared, and I uh, I mouse over, and it shows me that what it did after what Tidy did of those simplifications, it performs a very long sequence of rewrites. It's just using the fact that. Uh, the, the interaction between how functors act on morphisms and composition, associativity in the category. Uh, it's doing diagram chasing, yes? Uh, no, it's, it's just, it, it's not really diagram chasing at this point. It's, it's just rewriting and reparenthesizing and moving functors over compositions. It's, it's just very basic stuff like that. Okay. So what I want to quickly show you is what's going on under the hood in rewrite search. I'm actually not so sure how this is going to work on a small screen. Oh, here we go. 
This is just plain lean, by the way, uh, but it's it's lean launching an external Python process and talking to it using the using the metaprogramming setup. And this is it in real time, that is very slowly, searching the graph of rewrites uh, to get from the left side to the right side. Uh, here's the, the left-hand side and here's the right-hand side. So far, it's only decided to work on the left-hand side and decided not to talk to the right-hand side. Uh, it's uh, getting messier. <laughs> but in a moment, we'll see a little bit more structure. And, and uh, oh, and so the red line has appeared, saying, "I found a path connecting the left and right-hand sides." Okay. So, so we'll let we'll let we'll let the let's uh, let the graph settle a little bit. Okay, and zoom out. It's still a bit of a mess, but let's. Uh, hopefully, I can do this. Oh, at the moment, there's just a little physics model of springs and friction and so on, and the, the vertices are all just... What's that? Lean is done, and it's just the Python visualizer playing with the graph at this point. Uh, so, lean is done because no new vertices are appearing. It's just sorting out the little geometry of the graph, and it's just uh, pi graph is or something. Uh, okay, so we can see the red path that it eventually found, and maybe if I just drag some vertices around, it'll... Start. <laughs> so, the uh, is to find the graph for the <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, okay, what we can see here, now that the graph has settled a little bit, is that it, it maybe actually looks like it found a reasonable path in this, in this graph. Uh, we can see that typically all vertices have relatively like uh, valence. Uh, there's a slight color coding here. Slightly darker vertices are vertices we actually visited and computed the neighbors of. Light vertices are ones that we just discovered but never actually paid any, any attention to. We, learned, we could rewrite and get it here, but we never actually inspected this vertice at all. Um, okay, so you can see the fact that just from the fact that all the vertices are relatively high valence, this graph is probably quite a bit bigger if we actually search it further. Uh, the proof that it comes up with here I think has 11 steps in the rewrite. I can't actually remember. I, I, I did this by hand and I, and I did beat rewrite search, but not by much. My, my proof had eight or nine steps still. Uh, there are better ways to prove this theorem that don't involve doing this, but it's an example of uh, how you can automate, automate rewriting when you want to. I'm not going to try and do this in, in real time on here, but uh, rewrite search has a mode where you can ask it to uh, keep searching after it's uh, found a path. Uh, and in fact, the, the strategy it uses to search the graph is, is, is completely adjustable, and I'll explain that in just a second. Uh, the, this is uh, just a screenshot of... Uh, I'm not sure how I'm making this full screen, uh, full screen. This is just a screenshot of when I asked it on the same problem to search a little bit longer. So gray vertices now are vertices that it visited after completing the, after successfully finding a path from the left hand side to the right hand side. So this gives you a partial sense of, of uh, what the graph looks like. And uh, here's where I ran it until we ran out of memory and, and said, <laughs> please go away, stop bothering me. Uh, there, there are many thousands of, of nodes in here, and it's a very, very dense and highly connected graph. Uh, but what was that? Oh, there are many, many other parts. Uh, yeah, no, no, there are many, many parts here. Uh, it, I, it, it, uh, when you tell it to keep going after it's found a path, uh, the current mode doesn't actually notice when it finds shorter paths. We could set that up. To, if you really cared about short paths, you could tell it, please look harder to find a shorter proof. This is just the exhaustive mode at the moment is just so that we can get a sense that the graphs it's searching really are significantly bigger than the paths it's finding on the, on the first approach. Uh, one uh, tiny little picture here. Um, mostly this is just uh, saved here because I think it's a pretty picture. This is just running on a completely different class of problems outside of category theory. The rewrite search it's actually doing here is a not isotopy problem. So we, we encode graph, encode knots by Morse diagrams of knots. We write some lemmas that say that you can isotop things around. And we ask it to prove two knots are equal. And it, uh, it finds a path. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, so in the example I was showing you before, very interestingly, rewrite search decided to start working from the left-hand side of the equation we were trying to prove, and actually only explored out from there until it eventually hit here. This time it's working from both sides, and then eventually finding a, a connection between the graphs on, on, on one side and the other. 
So it's part of the heuristics. You can sort of adapt how you want to do the search, however you like. Um, so this is all very new, and I haven't really tried it out in many places. I also know that it's very slow, um, but we know some reasons why it's slow that we'll work on. So at the very end, I just want to describe a little bit about uh, how this works and how we traverse the graph in, a, in an effective way. The, the basic idea uh, is to merely use edit distance. So uh, we, if, uh, if, a, if a human is presented with, with a, a, a lemma of the form A equals B, they need to prove where A and B are both very large things. A pretty dumb thing you can do if you're not really sure what you're trying to do is to make A look more like B and just proceed in any direction you can that makes them look more similar. So the moment all of these algorithms are based on simply taking the expression, pretty printing it in lean, <laughs> just as a string, tokenizing it as a word, just on spaces, don't care about parentheses, binders, anything, just tokenizing spaces, and now essentially do a gradient descent on edit distance. So we, we, we don't actually compute the edit, the, we don't actually take all the nodes on the left hand side and all the nodes on the right hand side and compute all the pairwise distances. Edit distance is actually kind of slowly computed in practice. Uh, we keep track of, of, uh, of sort of interesting pairs of purple and green ones we want to investigate further, and only keep track of, of, uh, of edit distances between pairs, but then when you explode one node and add its neighbors, you now compute all the edit distances from that one to the, to the other side of, of that interesting egg, and then you just proceed with whichever one currently has the smallest edit distance. And keep going. Are you saying that uh, absolutely. This is this is completely blind to the mathematics. It just tokenizes the pretty printed version and goes for it. <laughs> okay. Now, it still gets good results. and it still gets good results. Yeah. yeah. So, it's, 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 the rewrite search. I mean, it's the exact same algorithm that's running on category theory and not isotopy. It doesn't care about the mathematics whatsoever. Where I, I have a fantastic uh, undergraduate student who's who's helping me work on this at the moment. Um, one of the things that we're going to explore is actually using the tree structure expressions in Lean and using something better than string edit distance on the tokenized value printer. Um, but the, the more interesting thing that he's working on at the moment, I don't have a working demo of, but uh, we, we, we've got to we've run it once to do something. Uh, at the moment, we just calculate the bare edit distance between the strings. We just tokenize things as words and calculate how many words you need to insert or, or, or add or, or, or edit to get between them. What a human will do, however, when blindly trying to rewrite, prove a, a, an equation of lemma by rewriting, is they'll search here for a little while, and they'll search here for a little while. And then they'll quickly realize that actually, on the left-hand side, all the possible ways we rewrite still have a certain collection of symbols in them, say, the symbol f. Whereas on the right-hand side, f never appears, but a symbol g always appears. And the human quickly realizes that what they're meant to be doing is turning the f's into g's, however, they, however it's got to be done. This is how I do maths. Um, and the, at, at the very first approximation of what to do next, they then consider any rewrite step that successfully turns an f into a g as very important. Okay. So the thing that we're, we're doing next is, after you've done a little bit of searching, or even based on the initial left and right, right hand sides, you just run a simple classifier on the tokens that appear in the two sides. You look at the, the uh, and just, just linear classification. You, you look at the components of the hyperplane that, that separates the tokens that are, that are familiar on the left-hand side and familiar on the right-hand side, look at the components, and use log of absolute value, something like that, as the weights for the different words in the edit distance. So this is now, if there are characters that are, if there are symbols that appear distinctly differently on the two sides, they now become very important in edit distance. And if you ever find an edit that successfully uh, changes one of those symbols, that counts as a big improvement in the edit distance search. And so it gets even more ambitiously is to do some lemma selection on the, on the same idea that when you realize by doing some, some initial searching and some classification that your job is to turn f into g as you, to get across, obviously then you shouldn't just, you should stop blindly editing. You should go and look at your lemmas and find which ones turn, turn f's into g's. Tell yourself that it's your job to use that lemma. Stop trying to turn the left hand side into the right hand side just try and turn the left-hand side into some form in which that critical lemma can be applied. And once you've got that, I mean, I'm out of a job. That's all I know how to do. Um, so that second step I don't understand how to do. I don't understand how to do the generating new goals depending on the lemmas we've decided to report. That's something to think about. I'm 
very happy to have suggestions. Um, but we're pretty hopeful that the, at least the classifying part and modifying the edit distance acoustic as you go uh, is something we'll have very soon and then we'll want to have good examples to that out. Uh, yeah, I think that's all. So uh, the, 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 the tidy tactic uh, is uh, in a separate repository from the category theory library. It doesn't know any category theory at all. Uh, you, you, do provide a, you do have to provide a few hints in the category theory library. Yeah. Really? So this is like the lemons you added after the lemon. That's like you just a hint for the lean, for the lean simplifier itself, which you would want to have anyway, even if you want to be my sort of one. The, 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 two, the two hints that you need to add by hand at the moment are uh, that you can annotate the limit of back and forward, which indicate that you're allowed to do backwards reasoning and allowed to do forwards reasoning and using that limit. Uh, there's, a, there's a conservative version of back that says you can use backwards reasoning if you can fill in all the hypotheses already, and there's a strong version of back that says any time you've got a goal that matches this limit, use the limit no matter what. So you have to add those annotations, um, but those are pretty natural for humans and their two characters, otherwise, they're there's nothing about that. Change that I would add soon is that that forward reasoning actually to throw out the 
the fact that you is looking forward to using it, it considers that it's used up the hypothesis already. Let's speak again.